We give you thanks in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Joshua chapter number 14 tonight. I'm just going to kind of make a, a little survey of, uh, of uh, this passage of Scripture. I love to, uh, I've preached a lot on the book of Joshua because I believe it's, it's got a lot of good stuff in there for us. But this is starting week five of a six-week prayer focus and prayer campaign. And so we're looking tonight uh, at, uh, at something that I hope will uh, be a reminder to you. If it's not a reminder, maybe it's the first time you've heard it. Uh, that's good too, but I want it to serve to help increase our faith and boost our faith as we get ready for week five. We got week five of our of our prayer focus, and I, just at your pastor's heart here tonight is this: it, if you haven't been praying extra, if you haven't been focusing on prayer and fasting in the previous four weeks, please, 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 for the sake of this church, for the sake of our community, for the sake of the lost, uh, pray, join us this week. Start, let today be the first day and, uh, and get in on these last two weeks of this prayer emphasis. Folks, I believe that God wants to do great things uh, even in the time in which we live when it seems like every bad news, every piece of news is bad news. I believe God wants to do great things. But nothing great in the kingdom of God ever comes about without prayer, without people being involved in prayer prayer and so uh you know we need to hitch all of our all of our horses to this wagon we all need to hitch together and, and pull in the same direction here we need to we need to pray because there are mountainous issues where in our in our society in our neighborhoods in our families that are represented here by this group of people tonight there are mountainous problems. I mean, what do I mean by that? Things that are too big for you to fix. Things that are too big for me to fix. Things that are too big for all of us together to fix. And it's going to take God to fix them. It's going to take God to give the answers to these things. We cannot comfort the brokenhearted. We cannot save the lost. We can't set free those that are bound and addicted and, and having troubles. We can't do it. But God can. And so tonight, uh, the title of this uh, talk this sermon tonight is mountain shopping and so in Joshua chapter number 14 what you're going to find there is you'll find this man named Caleb who 45 years before had come into this land with uh, with Josh uh, uh, with uh, Joshua and with 10 other men sent ahead to spy out the land and while they made their survey of the land, they came back to report to Moses and the other members of, the, of uh, Israel. They came back and said, ten of them, we can't do it. There's giants in the land, there's walled cities, there's mountainous problems, and we're not able to go up and take that country. We cannot do it. It's too great a task for us Joshua and Caleb, I know some of you, this is just a reminder, maybe all of you tonight, you've heard this story preached many times before, but Joshua and Caleb were the only two of the 12 that said, we are able to go up and take the country. God has promised this to us, and we're able to do it. Uh, but the, the 10 swayed the people, and so they missed their opportunity to enter in. Folks, let me tell you, I believe we've got an opportunity presented before us as a church right now. We can say, oh, the bigger churches can do that, or oh, some other church can do that, or oh, some other pastor, some other people. But I believe that we have a God-given opportunity right now to make a difference uh, for eternity's sake uh, in this community and in the areas around which uh, this church is planted uh, to make a difference, to see souls saved, to influence the lives uh, and futures of people we don't need to hesitate. We need to pick out our mountain. Now, that's where the story is in Joshua 14. Forty-five years thereabout have passed since Joshua and Caleb said, I believe what God says over what I see with my own man-made, my own uh, human eyes here. I believe what God says, but they missed the opportunity. And so for 40 years they wander in the wilderness while all of those men and women who hesitated at God's promises died uh, in the wilderness because of their unbelief. And then five years of military campaigning, 
five years of fighting to take the land that God has promised them. They'd seen Jericho uh, fall, and they'd seen other great miracles of God. And now, at about 85 years old, this young man named Caleb says, God promised me a mountain, and I'm ready to go take possession of it. I'm ready to go and take that mountain that God has promised unto me. You see, Canaan in this story, the promised land, it pictures the victorious Christian life. Joshua pictures Jesus, our leader. In fact, his name means the same thing as Jesus in the New Testament. He is our Savior. He's our leader. Caleb in this story pictures the potential that everybody in this room tonight has as a believer in God, as a child of God, as a, as a Spirit-filled Christian. So quickly tonight, uh, I just have a few points that I want to bring out before we go into our prayer time. And I want you to take note of these, and I want these to be your prayer focus this week as you go through this fifth week of our prayer campaign. The first one is we've got to surrender. Look at verse 8 with me of Joshua chapter number 14. Joshua 14, verse 8. Nevertheless, my brethren that went up with me made the heart of the people melt, but I wholly followed the Lord my God. Verse 9, Moses swore on that day, saying, Surely the land whereupon thy feet have trodden shall be thine inheritance and thy children's forever, because thou, hast, hast, because thou hast wholly followed the Lord my God. Then drop down to verse 14. Hebron, therefore, became the inheritance of Caleb, the son of Jephunneh, the Kenizzite, unto this day, because that he wholly followed the Lord God of Israel. Do you see the common theme that the writer here makes sure he includes in all three of those verses? He wholly followed the Lord. Three times in just the span of 14 verses, we're reminded that, uh, that uh, Caleb wholly followed the Lord. I'm telling you, folks, if we're going to see victory as an individual and as a church, if we're going to see victory, it's going to be because we surrender to God. Holy and completely and don't hold anything back, we surrender ourselves uh, to God. Uh, Caleb didn't hold anything back, and he wholly followed the Lord our God. Can you imagine two people out of about two and a half million, three million, the estimates vary on how many people there were that came up out of Egypt uh, following Moses' leadership, but we do know this for certain. Uh, only two of them said, God said, go, and I'm ready to go. Only two of them out of the whole bunch did. Uh, he wholly followed. You see, it wasn't the popular opinion. The popular opinion at that point was to bash the pastor. <laughs> the popular opinion right then was to say, why did this Moses guy lead us up out of Egypt? Did he just bring us up here to die in a foreign country? That was the popular opinion. D do you doubt me? Read the story. That's what was going on. It said at one point they were ready to just stone Moses and set up new leaders and, and, and go back. They moaned and murmured and complained, but two said, I surrender to God. It, it makes me think of the song that we used to hear uh, fairly often. Uh, uh, in fact, if you watched Billy Graham Crusades, you heard it quite a bit. Uh, uh, I surrender all. I surrender all. All to Jesus I surrender, I surrender all. We sing that song, but in truth, if we want to, if many Christians, if most Christians maybe would sing it with true lyrics, they would sing, I surrender some, I surrender some, some to Jesus. I surrender, I surrender some. Right? Am I right? Because that's how most Christians want to live their life. I want to give God my problems. I want to give Him my eternity. I want to give Him my life after I die. But right now, if I want to cuss somebody out, bless God, I want to cuss them out. Oh, no, not me. I'm just saying some folks, you know. 
Huh? If I want to, you know, if I want to, 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 to act vulgar, to act like the world, then I want to reserve that right to just act like the world, and I want to trust God to help me pluck up those wild oats that I've sowed so that I don't reap the harvest of the seeds that I planted. Oh, none of you folks think like that. I understand that. Y'all are the Sunday night crowd, and, and y'all don't have those kind of thoughts, but we want to hold back. We want to say, God, you can have all of me except my pocketbook and preacher don't you preach about finances or I'll find me another church where they don't preach about finances I have had more uh, silent congregations when I preached on giving and on finances than I have on any other subject uh, that I've preached on Folks don't like it when you start talking about money. When you say things like, I can tell where your priorities are by looking at your bank statement, uh, they don't like that statement very much. But I believe it's true. Somebody whose priority is the kingdom of God, you can look at their bank statement and see where they're investing in the kingdom of God with their finances. Those that are, you know, oh, well, pastor, you better move on from there. I'm just talking about being fully surrendered to God, being willing. You see, I've been challenged over the past two months by two men that have, uh, that have surrendered to God, that God has led them in different directions at, uh, at a, uh, you know, a later point in life. Brother LaVon Piker, who uh, was here just a few weeks ago, after over 20 years uh, uh, of pastoring, uh, being in a church that was going well and, and, you know, things going good, God calls him from the pastorate into the evangelistic field, and he's gone after God as hard as he can go. And that challenges me, and it, it inspires me. And then our brother that was here this morning, after over 20 years of pastoring, God's led him into the missionary field. And, you know, that challenges me. Folks, I want to tell you, I just sit there and think, would I be willing, would I be willing to give up on what I know and how comfortable I am and go in a different direction if that's what God says to do? I'm afraid sometimes the answer to that would have to be, no, I don't know that I could, that I could make a big jump like that. Church, I'm not asking you to all sign up tonight to go on a missions trip, uh, you know, uh, to, uh, to the dark heart of Africa. <laughs> and I'm not asking you to, I am not asking you to, to go home and figure out how much money you've got in your savings account and empty it out as a gift uh, to the church. I, I'm not asking you to do those things. What I'm asking you to do is to surrender to God and do what God asks us to do. Amen? To be willing to do whatever it is that God says to do. It may be something like get up and and walk across the room and tell somebody, I love you and I, I, I want the best for you. To walk across the room and witness to somebody. To go across the room and say, would you please forgive me because I know there's an issue between us. To be willing to take the step and to get out of our comfort zone and to do uh, things. You see, some people think that surrender is just for preachers and missionaries. And I tell you, that's 100% wrong. Surrender is the calling for all Christians. And by the way, God deserves it. Jesus was a dying sacrifice, and he calls us to be a living sacrifice. Because he died for us, we can live for him. Amen? He was willing to go all the way. Can, can you just think about that? What if Jesus had, had been like a lot of modern American Christians? Well, I'm willing to go a little while. I'll go down there and live among them, and I'll try to teach them, but don't ask me to die for that bunch of reprobates. I'm not going to, man, did you see the way they treat me? Do you hear the way they talk about my dad? You see the way they defile the temple? I ain't going to die for them. No, he was willing to go all the way for us, amen? Yes, he prayed in the garden, Father, if there be any other way, let this cup pass from me. But he ended that by saying, nevertheless, I surrender. Nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. And he went all the way for us. Why would we hold anything back from a God that is willing to go all the way for every one of us? Why would we hold back and say, no, God, I'm not going to give up my anger because sometimes I just like to be mad at somebody. Oh, God, I'm not going to give up my finances because, God, I just, I need that money and, and I, I don't know that I can trust you to, uh, you know, to take care of me. Or I'm not going to give up my, uh, my, my uh, you know, whatever my issue is. I'm going to hold on to that. It's like, come on into the living room, Jesus, but just don't go down the hallway, right? Uh, don't look in that bedroom back there, you know. D don't open the door. Just, just come right on in here. I prepared the living room for you. It looks all religious and, and churchy. I got my Bible out. and like, 
None of y'all, I don't know if any of y'all have ever worked at kids camp. But at kids camp, there's always two or three of the kids that'll come and they'll bring a Bible for the express purpose of laying it on their bed and leaving it open on their bed when they leave because they know that, uh, uh, that some of the counselors come and inspect the beds uh, during the day and they give room reports. And so they think, if I leave that Bible laying out on my bed, I'm not going to get a skunk bed. I'm not going to get a bad bed. I'm going to get a good bed because I've got my Bible uh, laying out. I think that some folks leave a Bible laying out on their coffee table at home for just the same reason <laughs> because they know that the Holy Spirit is going to come by that the Lord is going to come by and they think they're going to impress him oh you'd be surprised sometimes that when you, when the pastor stops by to check on folks uh, at things that start getting crammed and shoved and, and moved around you hear TVs being turned off and and things happening and you know hey we already heard it you know we've already been on the porch and we heard you know so it's okay uh, we're <laughs> It's too late to hide it then. D.L. Moody, one of the great American evangelists, D.L. Moody. Do you know he was a shoe salesman? D.L. Moody was a shoe salesman. He got saved, and then he became a Sunday school teacher. Then he became a preacher. He became an evangelist. His own accounts of his life says that for years he labored and saw little results and felt little power. But one day he heard another evangelist named Henry Barley preaching. And Henry Barley said, The world has yet to see what God can do in and through a man wholly and completely surrendered to him. The Holy Spirit touched D.L. Moody with those words. And he said, By the grace of God, I'll be that man. And an uneducated shoe salesman became one of the greatest evangelists of all time, seeing hundreds of thousands in his ministry make commitments to Christ. Just a shoe salesman from Chicago, I believe. Just a, just a shoe salesman. Just a businessman. You see, not everybody can be a Joshua, but everybody in this room can be a Caleb a faithful supporter, a right-hand man, a right-hand woman, like Lynn was saying this morning about those that are helping her with children's ministry. Somebody that'll say, <clears throat> here I am, Lord, use me. One of the major prophets in the Old Testament, Isaiah. I've studied more about Isaiah than any of the other Old Testament prophets. Did you know, you can check me on this. I I've done my homework, I believe. Isaiah, you'll not find in Isaiah's writing where he was called by God. You'll find Isaiah who had a vision. And when God said, who'll go? Who can I send? Isaiah said, here I am, Lord. Use me. Let me go. Let me be the person. That's surrender. That's surrender. He'd had a, evidently a fairly easy life until King Uzziah died. And then things changed in his life. And he gets this vision, I saw the Lord high and lifted up in the throne. I, he, the train of his glory filled the temple. Oh, I saw him and I began to be worried and began to be concerned. And I cried out, oh, woe is me. Surely I'm going to die because I'm an unclean man and I live in the midst of an unclean people. And an angel flew from the side of God and went to the, our altar and took a coal off that altar and flew back to Isaiah and, and, and purged the sin off of his tongue and off of his lips. And then Isaiah sees this great vision of God. And God said, I've got a message that the people need to hear, but who's going to tell them? How how are we going to get it to them? Who's going to go? And Isaiah said, oh God, here I am. Let me go. Let me go. And God says, you can go, but let me tell you, they're not going to listen to you. They're not going to respond the way you think they're going to respond. You read this yourself. It's in your Bible. He said, you can go, but they're not going to respond the way you think they ought to. Isaiah says, God, how long do I have to preach it? How long do I have to say it? God says, till I call you, till I tell you to stop, you preach the message. Yeah, that's the... Uh, the, the, the nearly inspired Travis version, but, but the King James reads pretty close to that, I promise. You can check it out. I'm telling you, folks, what can God do uh, with one man or one woman that says, here I am, 
Lord. Send me. Send me. Let me be used by you. All I'm asking you to do this week in your prayer time is say, God, I surrender. If I'm holding anything back, if there's any spot in my head, in my brain, in my heart, in my body, in my life that I'm holding back, God, I, I want to surrender to you. The second part of this is strength. Surrender is the first part. Strength is the second. Look at verse 11. As yet I am as strong this day as I was in the day that Moses sent me. As my strength was then, even so is my strength now for war, both to go out and to come in. Man, make me like Caleb. The strength of Caleb. We had a fellow in our church at, uh, that we pastored before we came here. And I'd hear him pray that. He was in his, he was approaching 80 anyway. And I would hear him pray that. I would hear him pray that prayer. God, give me the strength of Caleb. Give me the strength of Caleb. You know what? I think that's a pretty awesome thing to pray. Because some of us are closer to 85 than others of us here. But every single one of us have a point where our strength runs out. Every one of us have a point where our strength comes to an end, where we try to stand and work and minister and sing and play music and teach and preach and witness in our own strength, and that strength runs out. And we start to say, what good is it doing? What dent am I making? What, you know, my, this little light of mine, I, I'm really getting tired of trying to keep it shining, you know, but when we're laboring in our own strength. But we say, God, give me that same strength that old Caleb had, that, a, that I will run on in your strength, that I will, having done all to and I will stand there for God because your strength is going to enable me. You're going to make me strong. You're going to make me able. You're going to keep me strong. Caleb's strength was in the Word of God. Uh, look at uh, verse number 6, down at the second part of, the verse number si of, of verse number 6. He says, Thou knowest the thing that the Lord spoke unto Moses, the man of God concerning me and thee. You see, he remembered what Pastor Moses had said. You guys are going to be blessed. You guys are going to be, when you come into the promised land, you guys are going to be blessed. He remembered that word, and it was giving him strength now in, in, his, uh, in, in, his, in his 80s. Look at verse number 10. Now behold, the Lord has kept me alive as he said these 45 years, ever since the Lord spoke the word to Moses. You see, there again, the word, the word. He's remembering the word, and he's standing upon the word. Look at verse number 12. Now, therefore, give me this mountain whereof the Lord spoke in that day. The word of God makes him strong. As the Lord said. You see, Caleb could be strong because he remembered the word of the Lord. One of my favorite, one of my favorite stories in the book of Acts has to do with old Peter. The fact that on the night before he was supposed to be executed, he's sound asleep in the jail. They've got him in the, you know, if it was modern day time, he was on, he was on, he was at Tucker Max, you know. He was as secure as they could possibly make him. In the most central room of the jail, guarded with soldiers inside the cell and outside the cell, and he had to go through multiple gates just to get out to the street. He was as secure as they could make him. And you know that I feel like the way I read Acts chapter 12, I believe that's where that story is. The way I read that uh, is that it was common knowledge that as soon as the Sabbath was over, they intended to end Peter's life. So he knew, he knew that this was his last night unless God, unless God did something. You know, I just picture myself in that story, and I picture myself <laughs> having an all-night prayer, uh, you know, just praying and praying and saying, oh, God, oh, God, and the door still isn't open, God, oh, God, you know, another hour just gone by, God, oh, God, you know. But Peter's laying there asleep. 
He's laying there sleeping. He's sleeping so well that when the messenger of God comes to tell him that he's ready to take him out, he has to smite him to get him up. <laughs> yeah. And then they get all the way out into the street before Peter really realizes he's not still dreaming. <laughs> How could he sleep like that? Oh, it must have been a miracle. It must have been a miracle. Well, if you look back a little bit into Peter's life, you'll find that there was a point to where Jesus spoke some words over him because they were beginning to discuss John and his position with the Lord and, and what's going to happen. And Jesus tells Peter, you need to just mind your own business. <laughs> he said, you, know, you don't need to worry about what everybody else is going to do, but I'll tell you this. When you're old, people will lead you around places. They'll have to lead you around by the hand. That's what Jesus says to him. Well, it hadn't been very long since Jesus had said those words. Peter's still not an old man yet. Peter could rest on the words that Jesus had spoken to him uh, when he was asking, well, is John going to, what's John going to do? What's his job going to be? And, and Jesus said, don't worry about John. Worry about yourself. What am I trying to tell you? When you get a word from God, when God speaks something to you, that is your source of strength. And it doesn't have to be at a Rod Parsley or T.D. Jakes or, or, or Benny Hinn crusade where that great man of God speaks a word. It can be at your breakfast table after you've finished your toast and jam and got your word out to read a couple of minutes before you go on about your day and God speaks to you after your biscuit and gravy and gives you a word for that day and you can stand on it and be strong because of what God has said to you. He's spoken to you. It's no longer just the logos, just the, the word, the written word of God, but it becomes a rain a word, a spirit-inspired, breathed word, and you can stand and be strong in it because of what you've heard from the Lord. I'm telling you, the Word of God is where your source of your strength comes from. That's what Caleb was drawing his strength from. He says, I know I'm 85, and I know that everybody probably thinks I ought to just retire and find me a, you know, a, 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 a rocking chair to sit down in somewhere and leave this all to the young to the young pups, but I remember what God told me when I was 40. And I remember what my pastor Moses spoke over me and my life. And I've not seen it come to pass yet. And bless God, I'm ready to see this thing come to, hap come to pass. And I'm going to take my sword and my shield, and I'm going to go take that mountain that God promised to give me. That's resolved because he'd heard from the Lord. I'm telling you, God... Mm, will give us strength when we stand upon, your, upon His Word. So this week as you pray, we're praying surrender. God, I surrender. I'm not holding anything back from you. If you want me to serve in the food pantry, if you want me to serve in the jail ministry, if you want me to be a nursing home minister, if you want me to be a, a, an armor bearer for my pastor, uh, if you want me to, God, what you want me to do, I want to do. I'm surrendering. You, you've got the plan. I'm just surrendering. Then we're going to pray, God, I'm going to stand on your word. And your word says things like, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Your word says, I'm more than a conqueror through you because you love me. Your, your word says that if I will stand upon the rock of Jesus Christ, that the very gates of hell shall not prevail against me and against my church. God, your word says that you will add to your church. Your word says that you will build your church, and I'm going to stand on your word, Father. Your word says I am healed by your stripes, and I am standing on it. I know today, it, it, you know, sometimes those things linger. Sometimes you got to speak to those things and say, I'm not listening to that pain. I'm listening to the word of the Lord. I'm not listening to that. I'm listening to God. And God says, I can do it through Christ. Oh, we just got to draw our strength from the word of God. And now the third part is struggle. Sacrifice, strength, struggle. Look at verse 7. Forty years old was I when Moses, the servant of the Lord, sent me to Kadesh Barnea, 
to spy out the land, and I brought him word again as it was in my heart. Nevertheless, my brethren that went up with me made the heart of the people melt. Struggle. Mark it down. Nothing great happens absent of struggle. There's no victory without a battle. The door of opportunity swings on the hinges of opposition. You'll have to go against the crowd sometimes. You'll have to swim upstream, go against the flow. Caleb had to overcome short-sighted negative people in order to claim his blessing from the Lord. They're supposed to be on his side, but the devil used them and a whole generation missed the promised land because of it. Can I tell you tonight... I, you've heard me say this before, but if you're a reader at all, I want to recommend a book to you by John Maxwell. It's called Failing Forward. It's an awesome read. But can I tell you that most of the things that we appreciate, many of the things we appreciate as part of our modern life, people failed and failed before they ever were able to produce those things. There was, a, I, there was a minister. His sons got all excited. They had this idea, and they were talking to their dad about flying, about flying, and he told his boys, if God had intended for man to fly through the air, he would have created him with wings as the birds. Leave it alone. Do something productive with your life. I'm glad that Orville and Wilbur Wright followed their dream and were the first, you know, to fly. They had to overcome some opposition. Even somebody telling them, God don't want you doing that. <laughs> yeah, uh, it's history. You can check me out. I promise you that's there. Thomas Edison. Many were fine with candles and kerosene because that's the way it's always been done. But I'm thankful for light bulbs, Amen. Alexander Graham Bell was called a fool for his efforts to try to talk some, to somebody in a remote location. Now nearly every one of you have a phone in your pocket. <laughs> Wouldn't have had it had Alexander Graham Bell not gone ahead and followed his dream. Henry Ford had a dream of mass-producing cars so that everybody could have one in a day when everybody else said, We've got horses and buggies. Who needs that contraption? It just makes a lot of noise, and who wants one anyway? And we're fine. We've always had horses and buggies, and we're cool with that. Now, I'm sure they didn't say cool with that, but you understand what I'm saying. By the way, he succeeded, and guess what? He didn't have to have grant money from Congress to do it, <laughs> but that's another story. The naysayers will always be there. Well, I don't know about that now. I just don't know. L let me tell you something. Every one of us needs some people that we can tell our dreams to, that we can speak and say, I feel like God has put something in my heart. You need to be wise enough to know that there are some that you don't share your dream with. But we all need, there is wisdom that is found in a multitude of counselors. That's Scripture. Proverbs tells us that there's good in finding counselors. I'm not telling you to go off on a, you know, on, on a wild flight of fancy. This thing is birthed through the presence of God, and you've prayed about it, you've sought God about it, and you've got some godly, mature friends uh, that, you, that you've talked to and said, oh, I just feel like God might be speaking a new thing. God might be saying something to me. And they agree to join with you in, in prayer about those things. Because I promise you, in every one of your life, there's some folks that are just joy suckers. They're dream killers. You know, that they, they just, oh, I don't know about that now. You might know, no, no. oh, don't step outside the, the nest. We ain't ever done it that way before. But to be willing to struggle for those things that you know that you know that you know that God has spoken into your life, folks, that, that God has said to you in your prayer time, he's confirmed them to you through words that have been spoken over you and your prayer partners, your, 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 your friends that you know, that you trust, that you relay things to, your spouse or, or your prayer partners. 
will agree with you on. When you have that kind of a word, you don't give up. Uh, you keep struggling over it. You fight for it. You stand for your dream. You say, well, it didn't work this time, but God hasn't changed the plan, and we're still moving forward. We're still going on. We're still, you know, I've still got that dream. I'm still moving ahead to struggle for it. I'm asking you this week in your prayer time, let's struggle. Let's, let's avail much in our prayers. Let our prayers be like a, a struggle. You know, there's a saying that I love, how long do you wrestle a bear? Till the bear gets tired. <laughs> you don't quit, you don't quit before that or you're bear chow, right? You got to wrestle that bear till the bear gets tired. Some things that are worth having, you got to keep on. Well, I tried and it just didn't work. Man, that's the easy way out. If God has given you a dream, God's given you a vision, God's given you a calling, you got to keep on, keep on, and struggle and, and, and fight and stand against the opposition. Caleb had to not only overcome some negative people, but he had to overcome some giants waiting on the other side of the river too. Verse 12 says, Give me this mountain whereof the Lord spoke in that day, for thou heard in that day how the Anakim were there, and that the cities were great and fenced. If so, the Lord be with me, then I shall be able to drive them out as the Lord said. <laughs> it wasn't just the negative people that didn't have the same vision. There were giants waiting on that mountain. It wasn't like, oh, man, you know, that looks like the easiest part of the land. I, I won't, I'm claiming that land. I, I'm the old, I'm the old, uh, I've got the, the time in here. I'm the old timer. I've got the seniority and I claim that piece of, of, of cake over there. You know, that's mine. He said, you know, you know, we've been fighting for five years in the Anakim, the giants are on that mountain in their giant cities and I'm going to take that one. That, that's the one. I'm signing up for that. I'll take that. If you'll give me leave, I'm going to go. And if God is with me, I'm going to drive the giants out. You see, what is unsaid, but what must be inferred from that scripture is this. He says, if God is with me, then I shall be able to do it. On the other side of that is, but if I can't, I'm going to die trying. That's that surrender that I'm talking about. I'm going to do my best and trust God to make up the difference. But I would rather die in the struggle to free the land from the giants uh, than to live in the shadow of their walled cities. Oh, isn't that something right there you can sink your teeth into? I'm afraid too often we get satisfied to live in the shadow of the giant, uh, being, well, it's, high, it's good enough that we can just stay down here and don't wake the giant. <laughs> When God says, I want you to get up and strap your sword on and run the giants out of town. Get them, d knock them down and cut their head off like David did and, and be rid of them and not just pat a cake around and try not to upset the giant. In Numbers 14, verse 9, the Scripture says, Rebel not ye against the Lord, neither fear the people of the land, for they are bread for us. What's that in response to? We can't do it. They're giants, and we're nothing. They're big, and we're little. We're grasshoppers compared to them in our own sight. That's what the Scripture says. Caleb says, they're bread for us. They're bread for us. I'm not afraid of them. God's given them to us. Don't fear them. Don't rebel against God, and don't fear the people. They're bread for us. Caleb said, those giants won't be the means of your defeat. They'll be the means of your growth. Uh, we're going to eat their lunch. <laughs> Have you ever witnessed a, a baby chick hatching? If you've ever witnessed a chick or hatching out of the egg, what seems to be a natural inclination to do it's a struggle. It's hard for that chick to break out of that egg. It's not a real simple process, right? If you witnessed it, it takes a, a little while. And what seems to be the natural thing to do is to help it out. That chick won't survive if you don't let it break out of that egg itself. It's got to go through the struggle 
It's got to survive by fighting through the eggshell itself. Because when you remove the eggshell and you remove the struggle, it'll be too weak to survive the fight. And in freeing it from the eggshell, you're just consigning it to die. Folks, some things in life we're only going to have if we're willing to struggle for it, if we're willing to fight for it to stand up on the promise of God's Word and fight for it. I tell you what, I want to see a growing, thriving, powerful church, and I'm willing to fight for it. I'm willing to, to stand and to fight for what I believe God wants to see right here on Pleasant Hill at, at, at Lake Hamilton Assembly of God. I believe that God is pleased that, that Pleasant Hill Baptist is growing. You know, I believe that pleases God. I know Brother George, he's a solid man, a solid preacher, but I believe that God has enough folks around here that Pleasant Hill Assembly, well, I'm sorry, Lake Hamilton Assembly can be growing at the same time that the church across the street is growing, and we won't be having to swap sheep between the sheep sheds. There's plenty of sheep to be brought into the fold, and I'm willing to do what I can to fight to see that happen, but I'm not willing to fight all by myself. I want some folks on some pews to do some fighting with me to see your church and my church and our church, his church, growing in the kingdom of God. It's going to take surrender. It's going to take drawing our strength from the Word. It's going to take struggle. You understand that. that that's why you're here uh, on a Sunday night. But I'm challenging you to view your difficulties as opportunities instead of obstacles. Are you an optimist? <laughs> are you a pessimist? Or are you a realist? Oh, I'm not a pessimist. I'm just a realist. Faith Faith is optimistic. I, I believe that, do you? Faith is optimistic. I believe, and God is real, so therefore it's realistic for a Christian to place optimistic faith <laughs> in God. And you follow me on that? It's realistic that we place optimistic faith in an awesome God that's able to speak and the whole universe comes into existence. I'm telling you, you should be optimistic about that what God can do with us if we're willing to surrender. Well, let me close with one more story tonight, and this one's not very long. There was a shoe company that was trying to open new markets. They sent a salesman into this particular nation in Africa. He was down there for two weeks came back home. They called him in to meet with the leaders of the company and they wanted to hear his report. And he said, it was a waste of company resources for me to go down there. He said, those people in that nation, they don't even wear shoes. Waste of our time, waste of our money. And so he sat back down. Another fellow that was at the table jumped up and said, I'll go. If nobody's wearing shoes now, we've got a nation full of sales prospects. What one guy saw as an impossible task, because they're not even in the habit of wearing shoes, the other guy saw as riches untold, because everybody's a potential customer if nobody has any shoes. Huh? Why did I tell you that? Folks, we can look out and we can see the drunks and the drug addicts and the thieves and the crooks and the, the, the molesters and whatever, the people who are in sin, and we can say, oh, God, what hope is there for a holiness church? What hope is there for a Pentecostal church? Lord, everybody around here is a bunch of reprobates. Or we can look out and say, God, look at the potential that is in this community for all those drunks and those thieves and those murderers and those abusers and those reprobates out there to hear the good news of Jesus Christ. I'm telling you, when I look around, there's a lot of potential for the church to grow because, folks, there's a lot of people who still need to surrender their life to Jesus Christ. Nothing is too great for the kingdom of God to overcome. 
Father, I pray tonight that you'll help us focus our prayer this week on surrendering to you and asking you to give us a word that'll make us strong and God letting us realize it's going to take struggle. Struggle against other people that are not spirit-filled and haven't seen the vision the way that we uh, the way that we have seen it, but ultimately our struggle is against the giant in the land, against our devil, the, the, the adversary, the one that would come against us. And Father, we as a church have got, we've got giants, you know, there's, there's the, there, there are giants that are against us, the, the giant of, uh, of finances, the, the giant of manpower, the, the giant, God, they're, they're out there. But Lord, we believe that you'll give us the stones for our sling so that we can face them one by one and bring them down. Any giant, any problem, any mountain that opposes the growth of this church, God, you're going to give us the key to take that mountain. If these people that are here tonight will say, nevertheless, (laughs) it hadn't happened yet, but I'm ready. I'm going to go up there on that mountain, and I'm going to see if I'm going to be the one to drive those Anakim out and to bring victory to the church of God. And we'll be sure and very careful to give you the honor and the praise for it. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Praise God. We want to pray for one another tonight. And so uh, I know that we've been praying for our brother uh, Ronnie.